We're going to turn now and spend a little bit of time on an important subject, the controversial weapon in the U.S. war on terror. Washington calls it rendition. Human rights groups say it's nothing more than outsourcing torture. Rendition, and let's explain what it actually is. It involves the seizing of terror suspects in a country outside the U.S. and then transferring them to a third country where there aren't laws about just how tough they can be in interrogation. The CIA practice started back in 1995. It was authorized by then President Bill Clinton. It's unclear how many suspects have been rendered. We will hear from both sides of the uh, rendition debate shortly. But first we examine the case of Syrian-born Canadian Maher Arar. By Washington's definition, Arar was not technically rendered because he was in the U.S. when he was sent back to Syria as a terror suspect. Still, his case is being held up as an example of how U.S. policy flagrantly flaunts international law. Bronwyn Atcock has Arar's story. Canadian Mayher Ira is an innocent man. Yet based on unfounded suspicions, he was sent for 10 months of hell in a Syrian prison where he was tortured. Let me tell you something that happened during the interrogation. I urinated myself twice during the interrogation. I don't know what that shows, but my nerves, like, I can't control myself. I, I, it, it's so scary when you hear people being tortured. It's so scary when, when you are beaten. And I would just say anything, anything they want, just to stop the torture. Meher Ra was sent to Syria by United States government officials who believed he had information about terrorist suspects. Okay, I'll see you there. Arar's lawyers believe the U.S. sent him for the purpose of interrogation under torture. They wanted to torture him, but they, were, they didn't quite have the wherewithal, the guts, let's say, to do what they really intended to do was to torture this man. So they franchised the torture. They knew the Syrians wouldn't, wouldn't blink at torturing someone. And the purpose was, supposedly, to get information from him about his connections with al-Qaeda, which, by the way, are totally non-existent. Meher Ira is not the only case of what's known as extraordinary rendition, a secretive U.S. policy of outsourcing torture to countries like Syria and Egypt that's proving embarrassing and controversial for the U.S. government. Ara was the first to sue the government over this practice. In a clear victory for the Bush administration, his case was thrown out of court. I think some of our clients uh, are terrified of coming back to the United States. and even though Bill Goodman says this gives a green light for the government to continue with extraordinary rendition. If they can get away with doing it to Mayor Ara, they're, they're going to get away with doing it to whoever they choose to do it to whether he be a non-citizen or a citizen, in my humble opinion, and, or she, and that person will, who's sent to Syria today can be sent to uh, the Sudan or Somalia tomorrow or uh, who knows where the next day. Meher Ra's terrifying journey began in the summer of 2002 when he was detained while in transit at JFK Airport in New York. He was held here in a Brooklyn detention centre for two weeks, with little access to a lawyer. He was accused of being a member of Al-Qaeda and told he was to be deported. Not to Canada, but to Syria, the country of his birth. I, I told him, I said, listen, you're going to send me to a country that you know does, has no, no law, has, they don't follow the law. And if you send me there, I'm going to be tortured. So I raised the torture issue many times. Despite his pleas and with no legal extradition process, Ara was put on board a Gulfstream jet. It's now known that these planes have been widely used in America's rendition program, taking detainees everywhere from Eastern Europe to the Middle East. Once in Syria, Meher Ara's worst fears were realised. They would basically put me back to the interrogation room and they would beat me again like three, four times with the cable. And now they started beating me on my shoulder, on my back, on my hips, on uh, mostly. And they would ask questions again. Sometimes they would beat first and then ask second. 
Ara says in Syria he was asked identical questions to those asked when he was detained in the US, leading him to believe that his Syrian interrogators were acting on behalf of the United States. And I asked uh, the colonel, actually, I said, uh, you guys know I have nothing to do with, uh, with any allegations the Americans did against me. Why don't you release me? And he said, yeah, you're going home very soon. Now, whether should I believe, I believe him or not, because they lied to me all the time, right? But you could, I could tell in their eyes that they had no interest in me. Syrian officials have since confirmed that they only took Ara because the Americans requested it. Meher Ara was released home to Canada after 10 months, time spent in a coffin-sized cell in solitary confinement. He's never been charged with anything. Dateline caught up with Meher Ara again after he'd received the news about the court's decision. When a human being is wronged, the first place he would expect to go is to the justice system. And in my case, that's what I exactly did. And, and I filed a lawsuit two years ago um, I, 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 I wanted to hold the people accountable and all of a sudden the judge is just saying, you know, good luck. That's, that's what's, you know, scary about it. In his court case against the US government, Ara asked for compensation and a statement that what happened to him was unlawful. The case was dismissed, largely because of national security and foreign policy considerations. The judge said that he couldn't declare what happened to Ara was illegal because it could threaten the security of America. A judge who declares on his or her own Article 3 authority that the policy of extraordinary rendition is under all circumstances unconstitutional must acknowledge that such a ruling can have the most serious of consequences to our foreign relations or national security or both. The judge said that such decisions are for the government, not the judiciary. The task of balancing individual rights against national security concerns is one that courts should not undertake without the guidance or the authority of the coordinate branches, in whom the Constitution imposes responsibility for our foreign affairs and national security. Those branches have the responsibility to determine whether judicial oversight is appropriate. Ara's lawyers are shocked by the judgment. Bill Goodman says judicial oversight of government is an essential part of democracy. And this is a principle that goes all the way back to the Magna Carta, to at least 1215, to the 13th century, uh, and probably well beyond. But if the courts cannot get involved and cannot demand answers from the executive branch and cannot, in, cannot tell the executive branch that it cannot abuse its power, then nobody can then we're setting ourselves up for an executive branch which will, which is prepared to, will uh, likely and undoubtedly, in my opinion, will abuse its power. Bill Goodman agrees it's important to consider national security, but not at any cost. I think they have to be taken into consideration in determining whether or not what the government has done is reasonable. But I do not think that they are a trump card and can be played and as a result, no court can get involved in deciding whether or not someone's rights have been violated. That would be a violation of the most basic and fundamental democratic principles of the American Constitution. This is clearly not the view of the judge, though. He went as far as saying that the judiciary doesn't have the right to hold the government to account over policies like rendition, even if the law is broken. Judges should not, in the absence of explicit direction by Congress, hold officials who carry out such policies liable for damages, even if such conduct violates our treaty obligations or customary international law. 